It's time for America Outdoors Radio, the show that covers the outdoor scene across the U.S. of A. and the entire continent. Fishing, hunting, conservation, outdoor recreation, and great destinations, we cover it all every week. It's your country, your outdoors. Let's explore it together with your host, John Cruz. We start off this broadcast by welcoming WEMB AM 1420 out of Irwin in Johnson City, Tennessee to our family. They are the latest affiliate to pick up America Outdoors Radio. We are glad to have you here from the great state of Tennessee. It is Labor Day weekend, and I know some of you are visiting our national parks this weekend. I have no doubt it's a little crowded. Actually, I know it's a lot crowded, especially if you're at places like Yellowstone or Grand Teton the Grand Canyon, Yosemite, or the most visited national park of all at the Great Smoky Mountains. All of the parks I just named received over 3 million visitors a year. As a matter of fact, the Great Smoky Mountains, over 30 million visitors last year, if you can believe that. And unfortunately, some of these visitors are giving park rangers some real headaches due to bad behavior. According to the Associated Press, in July alone, law enforcement rangers handled more than 11,000 incidents at the 10 most visited national parks, which includes all the ones I just mentioned. In 2015, rangers issued 52,000 warnings to people not following the rules in national parks, a 20% increase over 2014. Citations are also being issued too, as rangers deal with increased incidents of illegal camping, vandalism, theft of resources, and wildlife harassment. Yellowstone National Park has been ground zero for that last issue, and it comes in the form of tourists getting too close to big, dangerous animals, all in the name of taking a photo or, even worse, a selfie with them. We're talking about bison and elk and bears and more here. The behavior of tourists who just can't grasp the animals are wild has had some serious consequences over the last couple of years with irritated animals charging or goring or throwing up in the air some of these dim-witted tourists. In fact, as of mid-July, five tourists had been injured by bison in Yellowstone National Park, and yes, three of them were walking right up to the animals to take close-up pictures. I'm glad. People are visiting our national parks. I really am. But I do wish more of these people would use just a little common sense, and I hope all of those folks working for the National Park Service make it through this big weekend safe and sound with their sanity intact so they can enjoy the parks as the crowds empty out and life gets back to its normal rhythms. This week on the show, we are going to be covering a lot of ground and doing so all over the country. We'll start off talking to outdoors writer and avid bear hunter Troy Rodakowski about tactics you'll want to use this month to bag a Bruin. From there, we're going to saddle up and let her buck and attend one of the biggest rodeos in the nation, the Pendleton Round up, which is taking place in less than two weeks in eastern Oregon. Have you ever hunted for pheasant, chucker, or quail at a hunt club before? It can be a really fun experience. And Donna Rahaga with Rahaga's Hunt Club in California will share some tips so you can get the most out of your hunt club experience. We've got news as well about a data breach to a license vendor who handles fishing and hunting license purchases online for over 20 states in the nation and will tell you what you ought to be doing if your personal information was compromised. Our trail of shame this week has us on the hunt for whoever decided to shoot several sea otters off the California coast. And speaking of the California coast, we'll update you on the West Coast tuna fishing scene when we talk to Del Stevens, also known as the tuna dog and author of a great book about tuna fishing called The Dark Side. We're going to cover California, Washington, Oregon, and find out exactly what's going on tuna-wise, or I should say what's been going on during the month of August. That's a whole bunch of the outdoors, isn't it? But then again, it is September, and there's a lot of outdoors activities to cover this month. So let's get started by talking bear. Next on America Outdoors Radio, we're talking to Troy Rodakowski. Bear season's been open for a lot of folks since August, but it's pretty hot out there. A lot of people wait until September to go after their brewing. And Troy Rodakowski is an outdoors writer and an avid bear hunter who's got some tips for you to help you be successful this month. Troy, welcome to the show. 
Hey, thanks for having me on. So, Troy, when it comes to September hunting versus August hunting or versus spring hunting, you know, what does a hunter need to do to be successful and bag a Bruin? You know, this year in particular, I, you know, a lot of people that maybe went out in August, uh, the berry crop and everything, a lot of the nuts and berries and everything else that bears like were two to three weeks ahead of schedule. So a lot of those are going to be finishing up in September. So unless you can find patches of those that are still viable for the bears, some of the hunters are going to want to start being patient and looking into openings and, and uh, travel routes and maybe using some uh, fawn in distress and lost calf calls because once those bears run out of those foods, the berries and the grubs and the different things that are ripe in August, in September and October before they hit hit the den, they're going to be looking for some meat or anything they can really get get their mouths around. That's, that is really interesting because whenever I think bears, whenever I think fall hunting, I immediately think of huckleberries. <laughs> if you find the huckleberries, right. you're going to find the bears, but you're right. I mean, with the everything has gone off early this year. Most of those right. huckleberries are gone. Are there some berries, though, that maybe hang around a little longer than others, especially maybe up on the higher slopes where you do have a chance to do that traditional fall bear hunt? Yeah, particularly some of the higher slopes might have some uh, berries that ripened later just because it's cooler up there. So uh, if a person does focus in the high country, uh, if they can find some of those patches that ripened a little bit later, that's great. Uh, another option for hunters is, you know, you got to remember down in the lower ag lands, we have a lot of apples and pears and nuts that will uh, stay on well into the fall and even early winter. So these bears will come in and they'll actually climb the trees. So, you know, if you can find a landowner or somebody like that, they break the branches out of the trees and they'll feast on the apples and pears and different different fruits uh, that they provide. So that's another thing that uh, hunters might want to keep in mind. That is a great tip. And, you know, uh, living in orchard country myself, you're absolutely right. I, I live close to some pear orchards. I like to go for walks along the edges there. And I always see a lot of bear scat in that area. And that's exactly what they're doing. They're going after those pears. Most of them have been harvested, but there's still a lot left that they go ahead and pick up as long as they can. Let, let's talk about some other things. You mentioned travel routes. And let's talk about time of day. I'm assuming when it comes to bear hunting, being there at dawn, being there at dusk is probably best. There's probably not a lot of movement in the middle of the day, or is there when it comes to September? In September and October, the bears are going to move as much as they can just because they do want to be building up their fat stores for winter. But yes, it's still, uh, you know, best in the mornings and in the evenings. But they'll also look to big open areas and clear cuts in canyons where the sun's hitting and they'll go out there and they'll take a nap during the middle of the day or they'll move around and tear a log apart or a root wad and so if you're in between some of these areas where there's several food sources and maybe a creek bottom that's where you're going to find bears and in september they're going to go where they're not being disturbed i mean if you want to really find bears you want to get away from where other people have been that's another uh, key to success in the fall especially during September. One other thing we need to talk about here, and that is identifying your target. There's unfortunately been some tragic situations in both Washington State and Oregon where hikers have been mistaken for bears. And I always wear blaze orange when I hike in September, uh, especially during the high buck hunt, because I don't want to be that guy that's wearing, you know, a brown T-shirt with white spots on the back. That's not right. going to be a good thing. And same right. thing, you don't want to be wearing a black coat and black pants when you're hiking out there in bear country. So I guess right. it, we just need to, to let people know, be sure of your target. Be sure of your target. I mean, you know, not only because of uh, possibly having a tragic situation with another person or another hunter, but uh, some of these bears have young cubs, and, and you're not allowed to harvest the sows that have the young cubs, and they're still pretty darn small, even by this time of year, the first-year cubs. So you want to make sure you know exactly what you're shooting at before you pull the trigger. It's very important. This is some great advice. Now, Troy, prolific outdoors writer, I know you've got a couple of articles coming out in Northwest Sportsman Magazine, which is one of the sponsors of our show. What are they going to be? about sure do i've got a bird hunting preview in the month of september and uh, you know it's going to cover everything across the state of oregon uh, from grouse to quail to pheasants and uh, hopefully some of the listeners will actually pick up a copy and maybe thumb through it and take a little read there well there you go troy always a pleasure talking to you thanks for the great tips i'm pretty sure they're going to help a few of our listeners get a bear this september thanks for having me john i really appreciate being on
the biggest discounts of the year on American-made all-steel Northwest carports and garages. RV, boat, or equipment covers with reinforced three-foot braces were over $1,600, now just $1,465 installed. A car or truck carport was $795, now only $715 installed. And through Labor Day only, 10% off buildings under $20,000. Only from all-steel Northwest. Call 360-277-0200. 360-277-0200. Lance Campers makes the ideal base camp for all of your outdoor adventures. We've been in business for over 50 years, and we specialize in making quality, lightweight campers for your pickups as well as trailers you can tow. If you own a half-ton truck, you'll want to check out our new 650 truck camper, made especially for half-ton short bed pickups. Find out more at an RV dealer near you, and be sure to check out the entire product line at LanceCamper.com. Lance Campers, quality campers for you. The 106th Pendleton Roundup kicks off September 14th and runs through the 17th in Pendleton, Oregon. Come watch top cowboys compete on a historic grass infield where the chutes are made of wood and the riders are made of iron. You can also enjoy an authentic Old West experience, genuine hospitality, a teepee village, parades, PBR, 100 years of the Happy Canyon Indian pageant, along with lots of Western shopping. Tickets are available now for all events at PendletonRoundup.com. Letter Buck. It's time for summer, and you need to be ready. So stop in at any OxArk store to find all of the summer supplies you need for your yard, home, farm, or business. OxArk has gloves, first aid kits, safety glasses, and even a full line of industrial tools. And don't forget, it's time for Gatorade and Igloo coolers. So this summer, be ready and stop by any OxArk or shop online at OxArk.com. back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz and this portion of the show is brought to you by Northwest Sportsman Magazine. It is the publication that comes out every month and covers fishing, hunting, and more throughout the northwestern United States. Look for a copy at a newsstand near you. Speaking of the Northwest, we are talking to Randy Thomas. He's with the Pendleton Roundup, arguably one of the best and biggest rodeos you're going to find in the United States and it's coming up September 14th through the 17th. Randy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, and let her buck. We think the Pendleton Roundup is the best rodeo on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We're not even going countrywide. We're going the entire world. Uh, I like that a lot. No, and we got plenty of cowboys that think the same thing. So tell our listeners. I mean, we've got listeners listening in Alaska. We've got listeners in California. We've got listeners all the way over in Tennessee. Tell them about the Pendleton Roundup and why it's such a big deal. The Pendleton Roundup is a big deal because it's true to its authentic roots. It started in 1910 as a Wild West exhibition, and the show was so wild and unscripted with real cowboys and Indians. It's, uh, it was colorful, and the newsreel sent it out across the nation, and it just became an instant hit, both for those 7,500 that were here and all of the people that saw it on newsreels throughout the, all the movie theaters in the country, and it still is that way today. It's an unadulterated, pristine environment. There's no advertising in the arena. It's a grass infield, uh, which is completely unlike other rodeos. Ours is kind of like a ranch rodeo where the contestants compete on a grass turf like a ranch rodeo. We have colorful wooden bucking chutes and just the presence of the Native Americans here. It's just like a slice of history out of 100 years ago, except it's top talent on top livestock and the competition is fierce and the money up. For the, for the competitions, over $600,000 in prizes and uh, cash out to the Cowboys. And it's the largest payout in four days in professional rodeo. Wow. So any rodeo that pays out more than the Pendleton Roundup, of which there's only five or six that pay out more than the Pendleton Roundup, if they pay out more than the Pendleton Roundup, they're in a bigger community and the festival lasts for more than four days. So we, we concentrated into four days of action-packed competition and the payout is high. It's just a great fun. Oh, absolutely. And folks, if you haven't been to Pendleton, Oregon before, beautiful part of the country in Northeast Oregon. And and like Randy said, 
In terms of the Native American influence, you have the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation that are right there as well. But let's talk about some of the more popular rodeo events that attract lots of people. As a matter of fact, how many people come to the Pendleton Roundup every year? You know, we sell 50,000 tickets for a town of 16,000 people. That's a pretty good feat. But there's people that come to town in addition to that just to be part of the festivities because the Pendleton community really gets behind us as they have for 106 years now. Uh, Main Street closes off. It becomes a pedestrian uh, parkway for Western vendors. There's a fair and carnival for the kids. There's the Happy Canyon Night Pageant, which is the oldest Wild West show in the country. And they're celebrating their 100th anniversary this year. That goes on every night. And uh, it's a cast of about 600 actors uh, and livestock, that horses and oxen that pull historic Oregon Trail wagons in that performance, and it's just really something to be seen. And as far as the rodeo goes, oh my gosh, I tell you, I think our favorite event in the uh, in the roundup is the women's barrel racing. Really? Because we compete on a grass arena, the girls have to run a pattern twice the size of any other regulation pattern in the uh, women's professional rodeo circuit. They have to run across the grass infield and turn on the track on three corners and race home. So a winning time someplace else might be 15 seconds, but a really great time in Pendleton is 29 or 30 seconds. And it gives them the opportunity for these horses to stretch out over this beautiful grass arena and it just looks like they're flying it is so exciting and it's so beautiful it is really kind of a crowd favorite so there's also the uh the typical favorites like bulldogging and team roping and calf roping and and uh we have some great exhibition events here as well like the american indian relay race which is just outstanding we have indian relay teams that race around the track changing horses each lap bareback actually with wow. just a string in the horse's mouth and they're flying and these are these riders are exceptional and there's a lot of money up on the line for those guys too and i tell you what that's a crowd favorite as well as as the wild cow milking contest and you know pendleton just does it old school and they do it well well hold on there randy uh i gotta ask you about something but folks again if you haven't figured it out we're talking about the pendleton roundup it's taking place september 14th through the 17th in northeast oregon and it's a really really big deal but the wild cow milking is that what you said Every day, this is great. Every day at the end of the performance, we culminate it with a wild cow milking contest. We bring a herd of wild mama cows out into the arena, and they found a gun, and teams, they have to go and uh, capture a cow, and then the teammate has to run up and milk it, and there has to be enough milk in the top of a Coke bottle to drain out when they run to the middle <laughs> to in the, in the middle of the arena to the circle. So once you have enough milk in your bottle, you got to run to that middle circle, and there has to be enough milk in there that you can get a drop, run out the lid, and then you win. So it's a wild time. Cowboys getting drug all over the place, and the cows definitely have the advantage, and they take the upper hand, and the, the cowboys are the losers. But we all we all seem to enjoy a wild and dusty ride on that one. Oh, that is hilarious. Now, Rand. Andy, the, the tagline for the Pendleton Roundup is Letter Buck, and I've always thought that when it comes to rodeo, two very popular events, obviously, are, you know, bronc riding and bull riding. Tell us about the prize money that's going on here and what kind of talent you're attracting to the Pendleton Roundup for these events. Well, the Roundup's in an envious position as we're right at the end of the rodeo season, and so all of the Cowboys that are trying to get to the really big money down at the National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas if they're not in the top 12 yet, um, they're all here. They're all here because it's a rich payout. It's the last rich payout of the season, and they're trying to get into that top 12 money in the world standings. And so we have top talent always here because we have the big payout. And actually, this year, we're adding another $50,000 in prize money over what we offered last year. And uh, so we're going to attract the top Cowboys. And bull riding, of course, is a favorite. At the Pendleton Round, if we actually have two nights of professional bull riding, before the rodeo on Monday night, the 12th, and Tuesday night, the 13th, we have a professional bull riders uh, competition, 40 bull riders each night in the Happy Canyon Arena. And that's a great spot to watch bull riding because the arena is up close and personal and it's limited seating and tickets are still available, but um, it's, a, it's a fantastic place to watch bull riding. And you're right, this crowd in Pendleton, they love their rough stock riders. It is really fun. Randy, we are running short on time, but if people want to find out more about the Pendleton Roundup or get tickets to go ahead and take in some of these 
fun, fun events you're describing. Where should we send them? Anybody can go to PendletonRoundup.com. That's our website, PendletonRoundup.com, and you can find out more about the events. You can find out more about the contests that are done here, and you can buy tickets there, too. So um, it's, it's all real easy, PendletonRoundup.com. Well, there you go, folks. Again, PendletonRoundup.com is the place to go to get your tickets to go ahead and attend the Pendleton Roundup. It's taking place September 10th through the 17th. That's all the events. The rodeo itself is September 14th through the 17th. This is a really big deal, not just in the Northwest, but all over the country. Randy, thanks for telling us all about this on America Outdoors Radio. You bet. Let her buck. D.M. Bullard Leather has been in business for over 20 years. We use Herman Oak Leather to make concealed and open carry gun holsters, as well as knife sheaths, belts, cowboy gear, and wallets. All of our products are handmade, and we even offer exotic skins if you're looking for something really special. Check out our products in 16 different gun shops, or go to our website at dmbuller.com. That's dmbuller.com for the best leather you will ever have. Come celebrate the 100th anniversary of Happy Canyon at the Pendleton Roundup. Enjoy legendary hospitality at America's best large outdoor rodeo, where top cowboys and cowgirls compete on the world-famous Grass Arena. Really, there's just nothing quite like it. Do this year. Celebrity chef Max Germano is serving up a multiple-course foodie experience at trackside dining tables during the rodeo. It's letter buck at a whole new level. Country artist Lee Bryce. Westward Hope Parade, Better Bank, Pendleton PBR Classic. It's a whole week of authentic Western lifestyle. 100 years of Happy Canyon Indian pageant. The story of the Old West with traditional Native American culture and a Wild West show. Dance the night away at Goldie's Bar at the Canyon. This is the year to cross it off your bucket list because tickets are available right now for every event at PendletonRoundup.com. September 10th through 17th. Letter Buck. back with America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz and this portion of the show is brought to you by California Sportsman Magazine. It's the monthly publication that covers the hunting and fishing scene throughout the great state of California. Look for it at a newsstand near you. Speaking of California, we are talking to Donna Rahaga. She is one of the co-owners of Rahaga's Pheasant Hunting and Sporting Clays Club located near Dunnigan, California. Donna, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Donna, let's talk about having a good private hunt club experience because I, I know you're set up to provide that, but I know that if you go in there with the wrong expectations or the wrong attitude, you can really mess up your experience and pay some money and not have a good time. So let's talk about what's going to happen right after you get out of the car. In a lot of places, your facility included, offers sporting clays. Do you recommend that people warm up with a couple rounds of sporting clays or that they just hit the field and go in cold? Well, if you're used to hunting all the time, then you could probably just go in the field. But for those who haven't hunted in a while, uh, we have a five stand and there's five different stations. So uh, we'll send somebody over there with you and you can practice for a little bit, maybe do 25 rounds and then you feel warmed up. Once you get in the field, you're going to be a lot better than just going in cold. I, I would tend to agree, especially the way I shoot. And I hunt a fair amount, but I know that it always helps if I can warm up on the sporting clays first. Let's yeah, talk about the true. next thing, Donna, and that is how many birds. Because pheasant clubs all over the U.S., you can go out there and you can just buy a few birds, and or you can buy a whole bunch of birds. But the experience is going to be very different based on what the purchase, isn't it? Well, what we do is we start out with the three pheasant card for $82. If you're using a credit card, it's a little bit more. But the three pheasants will take one or two people, we'll put you in a field, we'll plant your birds for you, and you have three to four hours to hunt. And if you have a dog, you know, if you have a younger dog, we'll accommodate that by putting you in a backfield. Our fields are pretty huge. Okay, that's good to know. So let's talk about the situations where you might want a whole bunch of birds and maybe even a mix of pheasant and chucker. Is that when you basically are bringing a group and you just want to get a lot of shooting in? Oh, yeah, we do many times. Uh, the guys will put together and buy a 100-bird card, and they're hunting all day. Sometimes they'll do half of the birds, and then they'll go spend the night in the motel there in town and uh, come back the next day and do the other 50 birds. That sounds like a ton of fun. Okay. Oh, they just love it. 
let's talk about the kinds of birds. Obviously, you have pheasant. And at your facility, is it all roosters or are people shooting both roosters and hens? No, we're shooting both roosters and hens. We plant half and half. Okay. And chucker, you know, usually, you know, living up in the Northwest, I, I've always thought as chucker hunting is a, either A, a young man's game, or B, something to do if you just want to punish yourself because it involves lots <laughs> of climbing up and down. But at a, at a facility like yours, it's a little bit easier, isn't it? Oh, it's much easier. We have flat fields. You know, they're lined with tall hills. But for the most part, it's all flat out there. And uh, the chucker are a lot of fun for people, especially if they have a younger dog, because they're stinky and they're able to find those birds. And they run like the devil. Yes, they do. <laughs> and, and let's talk about the birds themselves, because, you know, I remember one of the first hunting trips I went on. It was actually public land, but they were getting these birds from a farm. And, and the quality of the birds was horrible. The, the, this pheasant I shot, it was almost like uh, this tiny thing that was barely bigger than a chucker. It, it, the the feathers were all scraggly. Uh, you got to be careful about where you're getting your birds, don't you? Oh, absolutely. We've been using this same pheasant farm since the 60s. So they, they produce beautiful birds, long tails. That's why everybody wants the roosters, because the roosters are just beautiful. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. And, and let's talk about the, the qualities of the various birds. You know, you, you mentioned one already with the chucker, that they love to run and that they're stinky, so they're really good to work with the dogs. Uh, hen pheasant versus the, the rooster pheasant. You know, obviously the rooster pheasant is what everyone's after, just like when you're duck hunting, you want the drake mallard. But the, the hen pheasants? A lot of folks, you know, is that an easier bird for people to get into? Yeah, well, I think so, too. Um, well, the the males, they'll run, you know, they'll fly as fast and as hard as they can. And the, the uh, hens won't do that. They'll kind of hover down. So your bird is going to stumble over. I mean, your dog is going to stumble over them. And they're good flyers. It's just it takes a little bit to get the females up for some reason. So and this, this brings up another point. I guess yeah. if you're training a dog... Uh, you know, especially if you're trying to break in a young dog. And, and folks, this is a great opportunity. Instead of going out to public lands and doing it the hard way, take him to a place like this where you can really work that dog in a controlled environment. And from what I'm hearing you say, it sounds like, you know, working a field full of chuckers and hen pheasants could be very useful uh, if you've got a young dog you're working with for the first or second time. Yeah, that's probably the best thing you can do for your dog is to put some birds out for it. And we send... Um people out in the fields with the birds in a box and they can plant them themselves for the dogs you we'll know put them way in the backfield where no one's bothering them yep they love it yep and, and i've seen dog handlers do exactly that before and it works out really good folks so i think we've got a good overview of how to have a really good day at a at a pheasant club no matter where you're located whether you're listening today in tennessee or in california or oregon or washington but let's talk about Rahagas and your specific facility. You offer sporting clays, like you mentioned. You've got 2,400 acres. Is that right? Yes, 2,400 acres. And about 10 acres of it is our sporting clay course. Maybe a little more than that. It's, um, it's in a little canyon, so we have all different kinds of uh, machines up high and down low that are coming over your head or coming at you or straight across from you. Um, it's a good course. It's 17 stations. Wow. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. And let's talk about uh, the terrain, because uh, I'll be honest, I, I've been to some pheasant clubs where it's just, well, really boring. I've been to other ones where you feel like you're on a wild hunt. What does the terrain look like at Rahagas? Well, we have mostly flat fields for hunting, but we do have some hills in the back of the property. People just love those because they're secluded. And uh, they're a little hilly, but, you know, nothing huge. We have beautiful cover. It's all wild oats. They used to farm this land, so it's all wild stuff. Nice. Very nice. All right. Well, that sounds like a very pleasant day to me. Anything else folks should know? I mean, do you have a, a clubhouse there or there bird cleaning facilities, stuff like that? Yeah, there's a clubhouse here where you can just sit and, um, while your birds are being cleaned. I have two girls that have been cleaning them you know, for the last 15 years, so they're um, well rehearsed on this. And some people will sit in the clubhouse and just watch football game or something. Yep, that's... Everybody feels comfortable. We do a, a barbecue lunch for anybody that would like a hamburger or whatever. Sounds like a very pleasant day to me. And you mentioned that there's some hotels nearby, too. That, that whole 100 pheasant or 100 bird car sound like a great idea where you get into some great shooting day one, go to the hotel, and come back for a morning shooting day two. Uh, where, what kind of hotels are you sending people to? Oh, it's a Motel 6, but it used to be a Quality Inn. Uh, so it's very nice, and there's two bedrooms. You know, you have one or two-bedroom facility, 
And it's only five miles from our place. And there's a Jack in the Box right there. So you, if you'd like to stop and get breakfast, you can do that. Well, there you go. Grab your breakfast, Jack, and go out yep. to Rahagas for some pheasant and chucker hunting. Let's give folks your website. It's Link Rahagas, L I N C R A A H A U G E S. Dot com. That's linkrahagas.com. Go ahead and check it out. If you find yourself near Dunnigan, California, stop on by for a great private pheasant hunting club experience. Donna, thanks for telling us all about this on America Outdoors Radio. All right. Thank you, John. You have a great day. Looking for other hunting preserves or ranches to visit in our listening area? Well, if you're in Oregon, you've got to check out the Big K Guest Ranch, which is located on several miles of the Umpqua River. Warm up on the sporting clays and go pheasant hunting in the afternoon. Stay overnight in one of the cabins, eat some of the great food in the lodge, and then fish the Umpqua in the morning for steelhead or smallmouth bass, depending on the season. In eastern Washington, the Miller Ranch near Sprague also has a couple of cabins, a clubhouse, and some beautiful terrain to work for a quality pheasant. Just a couple of hours southeast of the Miller Ranch is the Flying Bee Ranch, located near Kamii, Idaho. This is an Orvis-endorsed lodge that won the title of Wing Shooting Lodge of the Year in 2014. There's a huge lodge here, excellent cuisine, and the chance to work with quality dogs while you hunt for pheasant, chucker, Hungarian partridge, or quail. Speaking of quail, you'll find those in abundance at the Meadowbrook Game Farm, located about an hour north of Nashville, Tennessee. Quite a few country music stars, as well as professional athletes, have spent time here over the years, hunting not only quail, but pheasant and chucker, too. By the way, bring your fishing pole, because there's a lake there, and rumor has it, the channel cat fishing's pretty good. Finally, another place you want to bring both a fishing rod and a shotgun to is the Eagle Nest Lodge near Hardin, Montana. This is another Orvis-endorsed lodge where you can fish the Bighorn River for trout and hunt some of the 40,000 acres of ranch and farmland for your choice of wild or preserved pheasant. You'll also have a chance to go after Hungarian partridge and even sharp tail grouse. Preserve and ranch hunting, it can be a lot of fun, and as you just heard, there's a quality operation near you. Waterfowl season is quickly approaching and the Savvy Island Duck Club is the place to be. Just 10 miles northwest of Portland, Savvy Island is a hub for wintering populations of ducks and geese, making it an ideal location for hunters. Savvy Island Duck Club offers day, month, and year-long memberships, and they are open seven days a week for all of your waterfowling needs. Spots are still open for fall, so contact them now for prices and reservations. Find out more at siduckclub.com. That's siduckclub.com. Experience the spirit of Homer, Alaska at the Salty Dog Saloon. Opened in 1956, the Salty Dog is a must-visit historical landmark for locals and tourists alike, offering beer, wine, spirits, and of course, Salty Dog souvenirs. Check out the ceiling of the saloon. You'll find thousands of dollar bills tacked up there on the walls, personalized by all the patrons. The Salty Dog Saloon, the perfect place after a long day of fishing to grab a beer, chat up a local, and enjoy a -a one-of-a-kind Alaskan experience. Tom and Jerry's Boat Center in Mount Vernon is Washington's largest Hughes Craft and Kingfisher aluminum boat dealer. As a leader in sales, service, and fun on the water, Tom and Jerry's only purpose is to make sure you end up with the right boat for your family's needs at a price that will make you smile. Whether it's a new Hughes Craft or Kingfisher or a new Yamaha or Honda outboard, Tom and Jerry's can take care of all your needs. Check us out at TomAndJerry's.net and we'll see you on the water. Would you like to own your own piece of recreational or rural property? Neho Land is British Columbia's leading expert in recreational and rural land. Whether you're looking for a five-acre recreational retreat or a thousand-acre trophy property to enjoy or leave as a legacy to your family, Neho has a property for you. Spectacular British Columbia has no restrictions on non-Canadian ownership. Visit Neho.com to find the property right for you. Remember, don't wait to buy land. Buy land and then wait. Invest now. N-I-H-O.com. Neho.com. Timberline Range Camps are known for their rugged, durable, well-insulated range camp trailers. Don't think of these as an RV. They're an RV on steroids that will last you a lifetime. They are comfortable, too, fitted with all the amenities you would expect, and they even include a wood stove. Timberline Range Camps can be used as a hunting camp or a towable home to take you to your remote getaway. One thing is for sure, all your friends will be envious of your towable range camp trailer. Find out more at SheepCamps.com. That's SheepCamps.com for Timberline Range Camps. 
Service is always cheaper than repair. That's a truism from Ken Estes at Cascade Marine Center in Portland, Oregon. Go ahead and drop by and see Cascade Marine for all of the parts, accessories, and honest advice you need to keep your boat and motor running. No one wants to be the guy plugging the boat ramp up because his boat doesn't start. So head down to Cascade Marine Center in Portland or give them a call or check out their website at CascadeMarineCenter.com. Welcome back to America Outdoors Radio. I'm John Cruz. It's time to cover some news, and this portion of the show was brought to you by the American Shooting Journal. It is the publication that covers not only firearms, but the shooting sports, too. Look for it at a newsstand near you. Our lead story today has to do with a data breach. That's right. If you had problems buying a hunting or fishing license in the last couple of weeks, you're not alone. Turns out a number of states were affected by a data breach to Active Network. This is a company that handles online sales for 23 states to include Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, and Tennessee. Here's what happened. In Idaho, they shut down online license sales after it was discovered that somebody accessed data for license buyers who had purchased their hunting and fishing licenses and tags prior to 2008. Meanwhile, in Washington State, 2 million license records were accessed and some really important information was released along the way. We are talking about names, we are talking about ages, addresses, social security numbers in Idaho or the last four year social security number in Washington and your date of birth. In response to this, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington all shut down part or all of their license selling last week, though you can now get licenses again in all three states, though not necessarily online. As for the other states, it's unclear whether they had data breaches or not, but this is a way bigger deal than just having a delay in buying your license because if you had your data accessed, you are at serious risk of being a victim of identity theft. That means somebody is taking your good name and social security number and date of birth and they're getting licenses, they're getting loans, they're running up bills in your name. So how do you know if this is happening to you? Well, you need to start monitoring your credit report. You need to start checking your mail. If you're getting bills in the mail for things you didn't pay for, that's a clue. If you are checking your credit report, and you should do so now while it's clean and then start comparing it over time. If people are opening up accounts, you are a victim of identity theft. You need to report it to the authorities. You need to work with the credit card bureaus to get this cleaned up. Hopefully, you're going to be okay out there. But particularly, if you are a resident of Washington State or if you purchased licenses or tags prior to 2008 in Idaho, you're at risk. You need to be careful. It's time for the Trail of Shame. Shame, shame on you. Shame, shame on you. Stories of poachers, scoundrels, and other ne'er-do-wells. So if you see someone committing a criminal act on the water or in the field, turn them in. It's the right thing to do. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Game needs your help to identify the person or persons walking this week's trail of shame. What did they do? Well, they shot three California sea otters to death, also known as southern sea otters. These furry, lovable animals that float off the California coast, they are protected, and now they are dead. Three of the male sea otters washed up on shore between Santa Cruz Harbor and Sea Cliff State Beach in Aptos between August 12th and 9th. Looks like they were killed sometime in the last month. These sea otters are protected as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act, and there's a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and prosecution for those available if they're caught. They can face up to a hundred grand in fines and a possible jail sentence, a sentence, by the way, that they richly deserve. If you have any information at all about who shot these sea otters, contact the Cal Tip Line. You can remain anonymous. The phone number 1-888-334-2258. Again, that's 888-334-2258. You can remain anonymous, but we need your help to identify whoever's doing this and stop them before they do it again. Hey. 
Next, it's time to talk tuna. We're not talking Charlie tuna. We are talking tuna fishing off the West Coast, where along the Northern California and Southern Oregon coast, it's been a tough month. That's the gist of a report from Frank Galusha, writing for MyOutdoorBuddy.com, who says that the tuna fishing was decent, at least as late as August 19th at Bodega Bay, where some boats got into some terrific fishing. But after that, things went downhill. In the week that followed, Coos Bay action was spotty at best. It wasn't really much better off of Eureka. And the Noyo Harbor Fleet just got plain skunked on August 20th. So between rough ocean conditions and the tuna, which seemed to have just disappeared, it hasn't been too good off the Northern California coast and the Southern Oregon coast up to Coos Bay. Now you know the tuna fishing news out of Northern California. Now it's time to talk to Dell Stevens, a.k.a. the tuna dog and author of a great book about tuna fishing called The Dark Side. Dell, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, John. So, Dell, I know you've been doing a lot of fishing off the Oregon and Washington coast this summer. How's the season been so far? It's a little different than the last couple of years, isn't it? Yeah, it uh, started really early in, uh, in June, and the guys had an incredible July catching a lot of fish. And uh, we got to the 1st of August, and if you're a tuna fisherman, you've been hating the month of August. It's been a rough ocean, and the tuna a little bit have been pretty scarce out there. Well, uh, the report we have from Northern California is they just kind of went poof and disappeared. Is, is that what's happened off Oregon and Washington as well? It is. It's, um, it's been pretty... Um, sketchy out there you'll get into them one day and the next day you won't even get a fish and uh, it's like there's just a small pot of them moving through anymore and I'm, I'm hoping that's not the beginning of the end for the season well and and that brings up something we've talked before this season tuna fishing can go all the way into october so it's not over yet by a long shot is it well normally no uh, last year though it ended uh, the third week of september and and uh, you know which was unusual and we're hoping the way the season's gone this year, we're hoping that it, um, you know, isn't what's going to happen again. All right. So I guess maybe this is the beginning of the end. We shall see how it plays out during the month of September. In the meantime, I know that you are heavily involved with the Oregon Tuna Classic, and there's been two events. The first one took place in Iwaka, or I should say didn't really take place in Iwaka. What happened with the Oregon Tuna Classic there? The ocean... Um during the Awako event, the Deep Canyon Challenge was just an incredible washing machine out there. 13 foot combined seas. Wow. You know, so we canceled for safety reasons. We canceled the tuna fishing portion of it, and um, the guys are automatically entered into a salmon side pot. So we added more money to that and uh, encouraged them to fish it. We also had a golf scramble. We wound up with about 35 teams that still showed up Saturday night and had a great time, raised about $50,000 of the cash for the local food banks up in that area. Oh, that's fantastic. And folks, that's one of the great things about this these events that the Oregon Tuna Classic offers is that the money and the tuna that they catch goes to food banks along the Oregon and Washington coast. So now you're at Garibaldi, and I heard a rumor, you know, you can tell me if this is true or not, I heard a rumor that the tuna were so scarce that the tuna fishing derby has turned into a salmon fishing derby at garibaldi is that true no uh that is not true actually um we did the flare start this morning at six thirty, and uh the boats took off on a very nice ocean and uh, it was actually flatter than the forecast had called for so uh, they had some pretty easy ocean to run in now all they have to do is find the tuna out there but uh, i do know from reports that they have caught tuna inside the 125 line but they are still a little bit scarce right now, so hopefully the guys will get into them. Well, hopefully they will. In the meantime, any advice for folks who are going to venture out into the ocean, whether it be off the northern California coast, Oregon, or Washington in the month of September? Yeah, you need to learn how to fish iron if you want if you plan to be successful because traditionally the fish uh, change their feeding habits, and typically they are down deeper uh, where the troll guys typically don't catch very many of them. And if you don't know how to work iron, you're you're going to have a pretty slow day, and um, that is the key to to late season albacore fishing. Fantastic advice. And by the way, folks, if you're looking for advice and, and just a great primer on tuna fishing itself, pick up a copy of The Dark Side. It's a book that Dell Stevens wrote, was published this year, and it covers everything you need to know about tuna fishing. You can find it at Amazon.com. The name of the book, again, is The Dark Side. Dell, 
Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for the update on tuna fishing this year off the Oregon and Washington coast. Thanks, John. We hope you've enjoyed our show this week. If you get a chance, go to our website, americaoutdoorsradio.com. When you get there, you'll find a preview of what's coming up this week, and you'll get a chance to listen to last week's show just in case you missed it. We also have a Facebook page. It's America Outdoors Radio. We're always posting information there, as well as some great photos that we take from around the United States. Another place to listen to this show, along with our sister show, Northwestern Outdoors Radio, is on the Internet. It's at WRVO Radio, the website to go to is renovioloutdoors.com. We also hope you'll support our sponsors, the publishers of four great monthly outdoor magazines that include the American Shooting Journal, Northwest Sportsman Magazine, California Sportsman Magazine, and of course, the Alaska Sporting Journal. Look for them at a newsstand near you. We gotta go, but here's hoping the good Lord's gonna bless you today and in the days ahead. Labor Day weekend may be the unofficial end of the summer camping season, but boy, oh boy, there is a whole bunch of great fishing, hunting, camping, hiking, and outdoors fun to be had in September and I hope you'll get out there to enjoy it. Remember, it's your country and your outdoors. 